Evan Bass, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing tonight? Good, Martin. How are you tonight? I'm doing well. Amidst all the insanity going on? Oh, you know, I don't know that I missed it, but <laughs> it's, it seems to still be there. So um, I've been excited. I've been wanting to talk to you in this setting for a long time. Uh, I'm sure you know uh, what I'm going to say. One of the things I just love about you is that when I introduce you, or how I used to introduce you, hey, this is my friend Kevin Bass. He makes robots for NASA. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I wanted to have you on. Uh, you're you're pretty sharp in a lot of different topics, but the first thing I, uh, I wanted to kind of talk about is what you do now, how you got into it, and for people that are interested in it, how, how would they be able to follow the path you were in? Um, so tell us about robots. <laughs> how, uh, how far back do you want me to go? Um, I don't know. I think like talk about your great grandfather and-, and Perfect. So my great grandfather came over from Poland. Oh, uh, so uh, honestly, uh, it this whole uh, robotics adventure started when I was uh, when I was five, and it was uh, a cross between Star Wars and my mom taking me to uh, a place that we called uh, that we had called uh, Showbiz Pizza, which is the same thing as a our version of a Chuck E. Cheese in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, of course, me being me, uh, after being there for like five minutes and watching the animals play, I, uh, I uh, asked for a tour behind the scenes. Like all the kids were, you know, playing toys and playing games. And I'm like, I want to see the robots. I want to see what's going on behind them. And um, one of the, the managers gave me a tour. And, and I just, between that and Star Wars, I just, I fell in love with robots. Really? And at five years old, I said, I'm going to be an electrical engineer and work on cutting edge. I'm sure at five, I had a slightly different language, but I knew I was going to- Cutting be... edge was cool robots. Yeah. I yeah. want to make cool, cool robots. Yeah. I want to make those cool movie robots. And so, uh, so that was it. So the rest of my life, I you know, spent probably the next 10 years annoying my mom by taking everything apart that I could possibly find. Um, Got into a robotics club in, in high school. Um, we had a, a couple specialty uh, courses that were actually at a different high school. And I had a conversation with the, uh, um, with the principal to let me and a couple other kids go off site for that class. So I started taking electronics. Um, got into uh, car stereos. That was uh, a really big thing for me growing up. And, and believe it or not, I actually learned a lot of the skills that, that make me as skilled as I am today, I learned in car stereos. Really? And competing in car stereos. Um, aside from getting into electronics early, there's, when you're in a car stereo competition, when you're, when you're presenting your car, you have to show proof that how you installed your stereo system that you installed everything neatly safely and securely okay so that means that you you know did proper wiring you taped the wires down you have power and audio cables crossed at 90 degree angles um, you're using sufficient power source um, upgraded alternator if needed uh, proper fusing within 18 inches of the battery and within 18 inches of the firewall um, and of 18 inches from the amplifiers in the trunk so there's a lot of it, attention to detail that I learned um, that translated into the way that I wire robots now. Um, I, am, I wire everything. It's one of the things that I'm known for actually is, is spending a lot of time doing the attention to detail, writing, routing wires so that there's proper bend radius. And um, What's you know, bend radius? Uh, bend radius is, so if you have a wire and then the, this would be a bend radius. So how much you're bending that wire. So if you have a wire and you're trying to bend it like that, what's going to happen is you're going to see fatigue uh, at that bend. And if it's, if it's constantly bending over time, then you're going to see those wires start to fray and break inside the jacket. And eventually you'll have an intermittent connection connection, um, which can wreak all kinds of havoc on a robot. Okay or any other system. Yeah. Okay. So, so you have to worry about that stuff when you're installing a car, car uh, stereo system or, uh, or a really cool one in your house, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll put a, a, a wire into the back of something and then shove it up against the wall. And then, you know, then you get this intermittent connection and you don't, you don't realize what's going on. Yeah. Just, just get in there. <laughs> Um, or, you know, if you're in doing a, running a car stereo system, if you're running a power wire through the firewall and, you know, the firewall is typically like a thin piece of sheet metal. So if you go through there and you don't put a grommet or some tape or something in there, then that's just going to cut through the in insulation and then you end up shorting your whole system out to your car. That's not okay. good. Okay. Okay. So, so you, you installed stereos, you got really good at it. So you won awards is what I'm getting? I did. Yeah, I, w I won some awards for a car stereo competitions and it, it landed me some some really cool jobs. Um, okay. Just what I used to put myself through college and went to college in um, in California um, at, uh, at, um, at a school uh, in Alameda and Foothill Community College and ended up getting an electronics certification, which was basically like a double E degree uh, compressed into a year and a half. Okay. And while I was there, I got, um, I got an internship to NASA. So I was one of many who just put my application out there and wrote an essay and got into, uh, got into NASA. Um, I applied for like all the jobs and the way that it was is, you would pick your one through 10 of which ones you wanted the most and they would pick their one through 10. And if, if they, if you line up, then you get the, you get the contract. Okay. So I got the contract and, um, and then ended up um, getting, uh, was doing like working in a really cool facility, the arc facility, um, but doing basic things like putting away keys like they literally dumped a box of keys on the table and said, here, figure out where these all go and organize them. And um, so I took the time to go and find out where the robotics were, uh, what building the robotics building was. Uh, I walked in, gave my, was giving myself a tour and uh, some guy yelled out, the, yelled out of his office and said, hey, what are you doing? Um, that man was Hans Thomas. And uh, I walked into his office and shared with him my passion for building robots and let him know that it, you know, it was my dream to, to build robots. And he happened to be the lead of the Mars, uh, Mars rover um, test bed at uh, NASA Ames Research Center in California. Uh, long story short, he uh, got me a, an internship position. I, I ended up breaking the agreement from my current position and giving, creating a whole new contract with that team. So I got the, the internship office, a whole new contract that they hadn't had before and uh, started on. And I did that for about a year and a half and I uh, got hired on full time. Okay. So this story is actually one of the reasons I was really excited to talk to you. I think a lot of, you know, want to say kids or people younger in their career, yeah. um, think that there's only one path to get, you know, where they want to be. And I think most people, when they think, okay, you, you build robots for NASA, you, have, you must have gone to Harvard, right? Or you might have, must have gone to some Ivy League school, which, you know, no shade on those places. I'm sure, you know, MIT trains you pretty good if you want to be a robot engineer. But um, there's another path because not everybody gets into MIT. Yeah. And um, whether, whatever background you're in and what have you. So um, that, can you talk a little bit more about like, what is it you think that got you there? Um, I think what got me here is my, is my, my passion and my um, never giving up. You know, um, the internship office told me, um, you know, this is, these are the only jobs that, that we have. These are the only internships we have at NASA. Um, this is what you have to choose from. We don't have anything in robotics. So, you know, take it or leave it. And uh, I took it and I, I paid my dues by sorting keys and drill bits. And then I, I went out there and I, I found out what, what building had robotics. And, and I started asking around and asking and, and looking at things. And, you know, I, it was that one conversation I had with Hans Thomas. Um, and really inside of, you know, some people call it um, an enrollment, uh, enrollment, right? Getting someone else as excited about something as I am. 
And uh, so I had that conversation with him and, and uh, he was willing and generous enough to create a whole new position just for me to come over as an intern. And then, and then, you know, hard work as well. You know, I, uh, you know, me pretty well. I, I work some pretty crazy hours. You, you gotta be willing to, um, you gotta be willing to sweep the floors before you can build the robots. You know I mean? It's, you gotta um, put in your due diligence. And I, I spent a lot of time um, doing whatever was needed and, and proving myself um, and, and remembering that I was coming on board to it as a part of a team, not, not out to just, you know, um, Hey, look at me, but like to really support the team. And so it was a lot of hard work, um, over the year that, um, that had them decide to hire me on full time. So, uh, ask you a pointed question. How'd you do as far as, um, sorting those keys? Huh. Um, you know, it was a, it was a struggle, but, uh, it was, it was fun. And, you know, I, I literally went around from building to building and, um, I mean, it was a pile of keys. It was a lot of keys and, um, there were a lot of locks. So it took me weeks to figure it out. But, um, I think the thing was that I, I didn't complain and I didn't, um, uh, you know, the other guys are doing cool engineering things or cool, fun wiring things. And here I am sorting keys. And I, I understood that as an intern, that that was where I was going to start at. And I think part of that is, is proving, proving loyalty and, and proving that you can take direction and, and that you'll listen. And, and no matter how difficult the job is, you know, I think employers want to know that when the, when the going gets tough, you're not going to get going. Well, one of the things, you know, I, I, I used to work for many years in, in corporate America and um, I had quite a few interns or, and lower level folks that I worked with. And some of them I mentored to be, become executives in their own right and others I didn't. And the biggest thing that would make a difference would be um, how good a job they did at whatever I gave them to do. Mm. And um, people go, well, it's ridiculous. How am I going to get promoted out of sorting a, a box of keys? But on a certain level, it's like they needed somebody to do that. You know, you need somebody to put away the spare parts. You need someone who's handling, if, if, if you've got your key engineer spending, you know, 15, 16 hours a day working on something, if you can save them three hours by doing something that you can do that they could do as well, but they've got to clean up after themselves, that's three more hours they don't have. Um, yeah. So someone doing a job well, um, that's, that's the biggest way to get promoted. So, that, you know, I think that's, yeah. a, that's key, my key takeaway out of your story. Yeah, I think, I think it's not even doing it well necessarily because you're not always, I mean, I've failed at, at many things uh, in my life. So it's not necessarily doing it well the first time, but I think it's the amount of effort and willingness to, to fail and to keep, to keep trying. Um, you know, uh, there were those, there were keys for, for some really important things, including turning on the arc jet and, and, uh, you know, yeah, it would have taken weeks for the engine and engineer to spend that kind of time where they were needed to design something. And I had to ask a lot of questions and, and, um, I didn't know what I was doing. I had to kind of figure it out, but I took the time. I was willing to stay late and, and take the time to lay them all out and to really go through them. So I think that really, I mean, if for those that you gave tasks in your career, were there some that maybe didn't do it right, but, but they were just, they just showed up and they took really good direction and, you know, just went after it. Well, you know, sure. They, it's, it, I did care whether they screwed up or not, but if they screwed up because they weren't paying attention, that would be one thing. If they screwed up, they give it their best shot and their mistakes were understandable. Uh, that's fine. I didn't care about that. What I really wanted is that they were, you know, it's really the context they had when they were doing the work. If their yeah. context was, I'm going to do the best I can to help the team, then uh, they tended to go above and beyond. I mean, everything else. Yeah. So that was what's important to me. So j jump, jump. Well, you want to say something? 
No, I was just going to agree 100% that, you know, the, the context or the, you know, the, um, you know, kind of how they're, how they're being, how they show up really makes a big difference. Yeah. So um, one of the things I'm curious about um, in terms of, let's say there's, there's, there's all sorts of different robots. How much do you know about uh, manufacturing robots? that are used in factories and, and places like Amazon? Um, not a whole lot. Um, industrial robots are, are a little bit different. I mean, there are some things that are key, that are, that are very, very similar from robot to robot. Um, but the industrial are, are on a much larger scale than the robots that I work on. So what's the difference? Um, so the robots, I mean, most, Robots that I've worked on have been bipedal, so uh, a two-leg walking robot. Um, I have worked on uh, on a couple four-leg robots as well, but it's when you're doing an industrial robot, you know exactly where you're going to go. You're going to do repetitive motion over and over again, so the sensing capability can be much less. You know, you can paint a box around it that that shows. Um, what its reach is, and then that's a keep out zone. When that thing is running, you stay out of that zone. It's going to go from A to B to C. Versus, you know, a lot of the robots that I've worked on, you, you don't know where you're going or what the terrain is. So the robot's got to be able to see in front of itself and be able to extrapolate what's ahead and be able to avoid or step over or maneuver itself around its environment. So, so the industrial robots, you can very much control their environment and uh, you can just stipulate, okay, this environment's going to go between here and here, uh, like you were saying, paint a location, or if you have a certain problem, you can adapt the environment to the problem. So you can put them on wheels, you can move them back and forth. Um, it's, it's a lot more contained, whereas your, the robots you built is to, to come up with terrain that they've never seen before, deal with situations they've never seen before. So that's the fun of it for you? Um, I think the fun of it for me, so I'm, I'm all hardware. Um, so I do all the uh, electronics and, and mechanical. So what's cool for me, what I love doing is taking, you know, a, a box of parts and putting something together, going from just random pieces and then building this thing and then handing it over to the software team and watching them just, you know, make this thing do magic just you know walk or i mean it's an it's incredibly difficult to to be able to get a a, a robot to balance uh Boston dynamics makes it look extraordinarily easy um but it's it's uh it's an incredible uh it's an incredible feat to be able to do that so um it what is it about the Boston Dynamics that's, what are they doing versus what you've been doing, let's say at NASA? What is it they're trying to do? Because other than scare the bejesus out of everyone, what are they trying to accomplish? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for them. I, I haven't, you know, I haven't worked there. I'm, uh, I'm not a part of that team. Um, so I'm just, you know, another, uh, another jerk on the bus uh, engaging. But from, from my opinion, I, um, you know, I, I think that they're out to, um, you know, cutting edge robotics, you know, to have a robot that could um, facilitate, um, you know, disaster relief, you know, being able to, to search for humans, being able to move on rough terrain, being able to, um, to say, carry a stretcher or, or to get to a place where, you know, a human is injured in a, in a zone where it's, it's uh, dangerous for other humans to go. Um, I think there's a lot of applications for the robots that Boston Dynamics is working on. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. I think, you know, uh, as a layman, we just all, you know, put it all together. I mean, for myself, I think I may have told you this before. I remember going to Disneyland with my dad and watching mm -hmm. the animatronic Lincoln. Yeah. And, you know, give, give his speech. I found it very inspiring, but. I'm sure if I were to look back on what it looked like, it would look so rudimentary compared to what you can do now. Yeah. But, uh, I was like, wow, he looks real, you know? <laughs> um, but it's easy to conflate that with what's going on, on Mars, with what you see in the movies and, 
Uh, and so is there anything you can talk about what, what you do now? Um, I mean, I'm sure there are things I can talk about. Do you have any specific? Can you talk about, can you talk about uh, what company you work for and, and what you do, or is you not, not supposed yeah. to? Yeah. Um, no, I'm, uh, I work for um, Disney Research and Development, uh, Imagineering here in, uh, in Glendale, California. Um, and, uh, and I work on robotics. Uh, and and any anything public or not yet? Uh, not yet. Um, we uh, we had a plan to to um, to go public with with a project that we were working on, and uh, the coronavirus got in the way of that. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the plan is. I think there's a lot of things up in the air, but um, I would love to see us come uh, go public by the end of the year. That would be great. I'd finally be able to talk about what I'm working on. All right. Well, in that case, we'll, we'll have you back on and uh, when, when it's public and you'll give us an update. I, I will say um, I'm extre extraordinarily impressed by the team that I work with. Um, you know, the, the electrical engineers and mechanical engineers and software engineers um, just really, I love the culture. Like they just all go above and beyond and they're, they're some of the most intelligent people I've, I've worked with. So it's, it's been a lot of fun to work there. Well, I know it must be pretty amazing because you loved working for NASA. So it has to be pretty good for you on a move somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was tough. Um, it was a really tough decision. All right. Well, that's cool. Anything else you want to say about robots? I've got another, another direction I want to take the conversation. Um, no, go ahead. All right. So um, I know for a fact that you make a pretty mean drink. I do. I do. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what it is you love about cocktails and how you got into cocktail culture? Oh, wow. Um, was not expecting this. This is a fun conversation. I, I would have had one ready had I known. Um, I, well, it's you not know, too late, you know, late, later. And then maybe when we have you back, talk about your uh, project. We could just, we could do a little video where you show, show you making a Manhattan. There you go. You'll have to do a, a, a video uh, drinking uh, drinking cocktails. Maybe, maybe hopefully in that time we could do it in person and then I could actually drink some of it. That would be great. That would be great. Um, so I I found my love of bourbon. Actually, I was um, I was in uh, in Washington um, and we were uh, bringing Robonaut to um, to the Smithsonian. And uh, we had a, a demo that we were doing there. And, and we went out one night on Bourbon Street and I found myself at uh, this bourbon bar. And this was, you know, 2012, 2013. So I can't remember, or even, yeah. I, so I can't remember, I was pretty, I was in my 20s at least then. Um, and I'd never had bourbon before. And uh, I sat at the bar and the bartender was just super cool and basically just took me on a journey. And I did, I just did a, a whole bunch of, of taste testing and uh, just really got into bourbon. And, um, and ever since then um, I've been hooked. Um, my, uh, my favorite is a Johnny drum presidential select and um, it just really got into bourbon. And then, you know, I would just, I would go out. I love a good steak. And, you know, a lot of the really nice steak restaurants have, um, have really good bartenders there. So I just started asking for, you know, Hey, what's a, what's a good drink. And, um, I was at my favorite steakhouse in, uh, in Houston, Texas. And, uh, and they make Sizzlers? this Sizzlers. That's right. Yes. Um, no, it's called Killen Steakhouse okay. it's in, uh, in league city. And it's uh, it's a one of a kind. And um, they make this uh, version called their, it's called their Midnight Manhattan. And it's, it's amazing. Basically you use um, a replacement for the, um, for the, the, the sweet vermouth. So it's typically, you know, two shots bourbon, uh, one shot sweet vermouth, and then a dash of bitters and some cherries. And so they swapped that out for their own special recipe. And it was, I was hooked. That was it. After that, I wanted to go back there just for the drink. And, uh, and that's what, that's what got me started. On Ever since I've been, uh, just trying different recipes and everywhere I go, I ask, uh, you know, ask them to, to try, uh, some new, 
new version. So how is it that you've gotten good at mixing it yourself? Because it's one thing to, to drink them, it's another to mix them. You know, when you want to have one at home and you don't want to go out and spend the money, you, uh, you learn. Trial and error. A lot of trial, trial and error. error. Okay. Yeah. So, it's, it's kind of the way you learn how to do robots, right? That's trial exactly and right. Trial and error, yeah. No, I mean, I can attest that you make a mean drink. Um, Thank you. I definitely <laughs> enjoyed them. Um, well, that's cool. You, you have a lot of hobbies. I do. Tell us some, some of the other hobbies you've got. Um, well, I enjoy building robots at home as well. Um, so I'm actually working on a life-size R2-D2. Um, so I'm pretty excited. That might be one of the things that I can actually work on here over the next couple months while I'm home. Oh, cool. <laughs> However long. Um, I'm also, you know, really any kind of like custom fabrication. I love um, building and fixing things, whatever that may be. Um, currently building a custom wood uh, workshop, uh, wood bench, uh, a desk for um, I can work from home uh, as well as uh, a whole workshop, a whole workbench where I can do woodworking and um, I do work on my cars, um, motorcycle, you know, rebuild, all that fun stuff. Um, really into drones as well, flying drones. Um, I lo always love like hobbies and... Um, so where do, where do you like to fly the drones? Uh, I haven't done a whole lot here in the area, actually. I, I used to fly them um, in, when I was in Houston. I used to fly them a lot um, over over the Gulf, over the coast, um, over uh, even just uh, over my neighborhood, my home. Um, we had like a, there was a, a river that went through, so just kind of going through and and getting some video footage of that. And then um, a really good buddy of mine and I, we went to uh, we rode our motorcycles down to the beach and we would ride along the beach. And so I would, I got a bunch of video footage of him uh, riding his motorcycle on the beach, which was, which was really cool doing, doing wheelies and he was doing jumps and all kinds of fun things. So that was pretty exciting. That was eight years ago, maybe. Um, I had a friend who, uh, who used to do that, that he would do the, uh, the drones uh, when I worked over at Molina. So he lives in Long Beach as well. And just his pictures were just breathtaking. It was unbelievable. The things that you can, you know, when you, you, you put it over the ocean, you can't go more than a little bit, you know, the battery restrictions or what have you. But he was yeah. able to still get some pretty breathtaking stuff. And, and it's, it's like the, the, the camera angles that you get in the movies. You can do some of the things that you could not do otherwise. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if you can take some uh, drone footage right now, uh, I'm sure that you could repurpose that when when the uh, the quarantine is over, you'd be able to use that. I'm so sure a lot of movies would want to use your footage for the apocalypse. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, uh, now would be a great time for uh, for producers to be shooting uh, apocalyptic video. Fly over the 405. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so you, you ever want to uh, do any kind of other business ventures besides doing robots? It seemed like the, you'd be the entrepreneurial type. Yeah, I, um, you know, I've been, been looking at that, especially with, uh, you know, with this virus going around and, um, you know, just getting, getting older in my career. I'm 43 now and, and just looking at, um, you know, I enjoy a lot of, a lot of extreme sports and, and doing a lot of fun things outdoors. So, you know, the fear of injuring myself to the point where I can't build robots anymore is, is um, becoming more and more prevalent in my life. Um, especially with things like this, you know, I, um, it's really difficult for me to work from home given that I'm typically assembling or, um, you know, building or fixing or maintaining a lab. Um, so really thinking about what's next for me, that's kind of one of the things I'm inquiring about. Um, you know, I thought about going on the road and, and, uh, setting up robotic shops for different companies, um, throughout the U S you know, just drive, live out of an RV and just, uh, drive, you know, from state to state or, you know, wherever, wherever they need, um, doing some video footage and, and, uh, you know, getting drone footage and, and, um, video editing, that kind of thing, setting up just a, a base. Um, I've also really always been into uh, leadership and transformational work. So leading workshops or um, leadership trainings, um, you know, different types of things like that. Um, you know, life 
I hate life coaching, but you know, there's a degree to which, um, you know, having anyone in your life who's, who's there is going to hold you to account, um, who's got an idea of, of good direction and, and going to keep you from believing your own, uh, uh, you know, the things that you tell yourself, right? So, um, you know, that's also something that I've been interested in doing. You yeah. can say bullshit. Bullshit? Okay, good. <laughs> It kind of needed to be said. It needed to be said. Yeah. You no, know, we. I, I think we. Uh, we have a tendency to believe our own bullshit, and, and uh, keep keeps us from from being productive or or taking on the thing. You know that that midnight twinkie or that. You know, oh, I don't feel like going to the gym. I don't need to. I went yesterday, or you know, whatever it is that you know that goes on in our heads that keeps us from really being productive. Um, when you have someone else external to you that can really see that whole picture. Um, and has something at stake to to push you forward and to call you forward. Um, it's extraordinarily powerful. Well, what I think is so interesting is that knowing you, you have like these conflicting desires. On the one hand, you love building and tinkering, and that has you work for massive organ. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna build a part of a robot that's gonna go to Mars on your own, and you're probably not gonna build you know. Um, a robot that's going to be in the movies or a theme park. Um, I don't even know what, what you're building. I just know. <laughs> right. But you wouldn't do that on your own either. But on the other hand, like, I just know you just love tinkering. And uh, part of that is I, you know, like I could see you repairing lawnmowers and having a good old time and, and building souped up lawnmowers and souped up, you know, every kind of contraption. And yeah. uh, I think, I, I could I could see you doing being a small business owner. Um, I also think you would enjoy teaching kids how to do what you do. You could just imagine you got like ten, you know, eight year olds or twelve year olds that that want to tinker and teaching them how to build a little, you know, use Lego parts and 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 build a little mini R two D two or you know something that operates. Yeah, It'd be a lot of fun for you. It would. Yeah. So uh, moving on to something a little bit more serious. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think this whole virus, what, do, what changes do you see to our society based upon, that was a very somber segue, but you know, there yeah. you go. Uh, <laughs> maybe you need one of those Manhattans right now. I do. I do. Can we pause? <laughs> <laughs> we could, but I guess we're not going to, um, so anything, anything you've noticed since, uh, since so we've been in quarantine, what, uh, a week, 10 days now? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I hear a, a lot of people with a lot of different perspectives, actually, um, you know, the perspective from, you know, this is serious and, and, you know, we need to, we need to hunker down and, and keep the social distancing and, and really, um, you know, maybe things are or not being handled the best way that they could be, but what's best for society right now is if you're not mandatory to, to stay that, you know, to hunker down and, and, you know, do, do our best to, to take care of ourselves and take care of each other. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of other, you have the, you know, some, some kids out at, uh, you know, at South Padre partying it up and like, no, it's my, it's my spring break. Nothing's going to get in the way of my spring break. And, um, you know, but what yeah. I'm what I'm I'm talking about specifically is let's assume you know the kids will get the virus or they won't and they'll yeah. kill people by what they're doing or they won't or whatever will happen and at some point you know we're gonna we're gonna come out from hibernation whether there's you know huge numbers of us who died or just a few people and we're wondering why we overreacted whatever it is that happens on the other side of it how do you see things are going to be different I mean. Do you, how old were you, I guess you were, how old were you in 9-11? Um, wow, I don't even remember. So I was, so I think you were probably in your 20s. I was yeah. uh, 36 when it happened, maybe 37. Okay. Um, and uh, I did a lot of travel for my job. I was, you know, one of those, uh, I, I think it was at American Airlines at the time or United and I was at their top level and what have you and traveling before and traveling after is a completely different experience. 
I used to actually enjoy air travel. I mean, it was, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I remember even fl I used to fly LA to London and I could, I could be there an hour before and be very confident I'll make my flight. It's really no problem. Um, yeah. But now, you know, it's a crapshoot and you're always there pretty early and it just, it adds so many hours. And unless you were alive and in kind of in your career, then you just don't understand the changes that happened before and after. And some things, you know, really never changed. Um, whether it's, it worked or didn't work, I don't know, but there, there's some things changed. So one of the things I'm wondering about is, you know, like um, I was, I was, uh, watching this show and they were talking about, as it happens, South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. And um, they were talking about uh, how they, they would fund the next year out of the profits they made from this year. So the question is, you know, they've had to lay off a lot of people. Is there going to be one next year? Even if right now we fixed everything and said, okay, um, uh, there's no problem with the virus. You can, you can, you can meet again would they be able to put one on? And if they would, how many people would say, how many companies would say, you know, we can't afford to send that many people. And, you know, like out of, out of this short term, there's going to be a lot of changes. I know you and I have uh, some, some friends, one in particular I spoke to earlier, who's got a couple of, of restaurants, got one big Mexican restaurant that, that you and I like. Yeah. And um, you know, it's it's pretty tough right now he's he, takeout is only a small part of his business and uh he's gonna have to deal with even if we stop quarantine in two weeks it's gonna be a big hit if we stop quarantine in two months i don't know how he's gonna be able to you know and on the and then you you think about i was talking to my daughter and talk, she's in new orleans and what she's dealing with and you look at all the different states and uh you know, what's going to go on with all the people, how many people are going to have a hard time paying their mortgage and paying rent. And, you know, like you could say, well, don't pay rent. Great. But there's people that own those buildings and they've got to pay their mortgages. Great. Don't pay your mortgage. Okay. Well, you know, what happens if all the banks crash and uh, we've already been borrowed so much of the hilt. I, I don't mean for this to get political or what have you. I'm just saying, looking on the other side of it, uh, short term, a lot of businesses are going to fail, but long term, you know, I can imagine that uh, people will stop leveraging real estate the way they've been leveraging real estate. Hmm. Uh, people will. Um, so, you know, what's great about all this globalization is uh, it's way cheaper to get something fabricated in China than it is now. But, um, you know, we've got all these drugs and all these, um, masks and what have you they're fabricated in china and forget about the political side of it just to, from the practical side if uh if you've got a million masks there in china and they need them just as much as we do and they're not letting them out what you know you just look the supply chain is going to change um i think about how in our you know my my grandfather's generation um I don't know. I don't know how old your grand. Maybe it's your great grandparents. Uh, the the depression really shaped their ethos, and uh, I know that, let's say, two generations before me, the idea of paying off a house was a, an idea of celebration. Yeah. And up until now, if you were able to pay off your mortgage, well, you take out another one so that you could leverage it and buy another piece of property. But now I'm sure a lot of people who made that decision are thinking, wow, I wish I had just paid off my house and be done with it. Yeah. Um, so what do you, th that's me talking a lot. So what do you think? Can you see any places where changes are going to be permanent? Um, you know, I don't know what it's going to look. I can tell you what I hope to see. Um, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd hope to see um, more, uh, more jobs uh, coming to the U S coming back to the U S you know, we are, we rely on a lot of other, a lot of other countries, um, especially China for a lot of our product. Um, they copy a lot of our product and sell it much cheaper, um, as you know, offshoot brands. So I, I think bringing some of that manufacturing back here would be, would be good. Um, and I think that's important. I, um, you know, the, 
there's definitely some uh, some things with the, with the healthcare system. Um, you know, the the degree to which they've been able to to find something that they think works and and send it to trial as quick in as short a time period as they have. You know, was less than two months, right? Um, I know that it's not, it has not gone through the same process it would normally. And I know this um, medication was not designed specifically for the coronavirus, but there's promising hope that, that this will help in, you know, a great deal. Um, and I know that if it were not this type of pandemic, this type of emergency, they wouldn't even have gone there. They'd take the, you know, five to 10 years, um, take that long road. So I'd like to see that shortened. And that's not really a good balancing of risk, is it? What do you mean? Well, right now, that because it's all hands on deck, everyone's in emergency. So what happens if they've got a three-month trial and people die from oh, right. pollution? Well, they might die anyway, right? Yeah. So, you know, what the heck? We may as well uh, we'd take the risk or reward. Well, it's the same thing with, say, cancer patients. It's the same thing with people that are in dire straits. They're... Yeah, they're in that situation. We probably should have a more streamlined, a more balanced way to to do that. So that's that's a good example. Um, I wonder though. So you know, when this is all done, uh, wonder the effect it'll be on like sports. You know, do you want to be with another hundred thousand people in a football stadium? Uh, if we're gonna we're gonna want more things virtually. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see. You know, doing. You know the the ability to do uh, to do virtual reality or three D, you know where you're actually you have on goggles and you look to your left and your right. You're at a sporting event and what's happening in front of you is live. And then to either side of you, you're looking at a virtual person. Um, I don't, it'll be interesting to see how that how that plays out. If if people will um, use this scare to to go more virtual or if when they get out of this, they'll be so glad to come back to society that they'll want to be more personable. You know, I'm, I'm really curious actually to see how this is going to impact um, the younger generation who spend so much time on their phones, buried in social media, all of that, if this is going to exacerbate that, or if, if this is going to bring them closer to bring us all closer to each other, closer to family and wanting us to be more one-on-one. -on -one. I know that since I've been here, I've been reaching out to my family and calling them and uh, reaching out to my friends and checking in and, and, you know, really wishing that in this time I could, you know, have a bourbon and cigar night or, or, you know, get together with those that I, that I love. Yeah. I mean, I'd much rather be having this conversation in person yeah. than over this. And, uh, you know, I mean, you and I know each other well enough that we can, we can kind of pull in some of the distance but the reality is that you know it's there's something different about being in the same personal space it's it's uh more intimate it uh, is but you know so i'm thinking for example it, you know as, as i've been doing a lot of training recently you know and I, I i i launched the negotiation skills workshop there's something really magical about having you know 10 people in a room doing that together now you know out of necessity i'm uh, rewriting the course so that I can do it virtually with something like this. And, um, you know, I, I want to make it to be a really good experience for people. But uh, if we didn't have to do that, wouldn't it be so much better to do that in, in real life? But, you know, the question is, if, if, if everyone gets used to doing this training by Zoom or by similar types of methods, you know. I, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I've been a part of a bunch of training programs that have tried to go on virtual um, seminars and things like that. And, and I, it is just hands down, not as effective in my opinion. I just don't think, um, you know, there's a way that we interact with each other when we're one-on-one. -on -one. There's a, a way that we put, like, especially when it's a transformational workshop or, or something where um, I don't know what you would, how you would describe it, but you know, when you're, you're really leaning into it, like there's, there's something at stake. You're, you're, you're wanting to change something about yourself or you're wanting to elevate your ability to do something that, that one-on-one -on -one, um, digging into the conversation just seems to be so much more effective to, for me. Yeah. Well, I wonder, I, I guess we'll find out soon enough if we're lucky, what, how society changes, but um, 
I just wonder, I mean, uh, I sound like the old man on the symptoms, you know, or get off my lawn, but <laughs> I can't stand how much everyone uses text and, and thinks text is real conversations. Yeah. But you know, all the, the kids today, they do that. They love the texting. Right. And I say this is a techie that understands all these technologies and, you know, I get Slack, I get all this other stuff, but, um, uh, in when, when I, um, talk about, let's say relationship coaching, which I'll do some of, and, and people are so like, well, I text, I texted my wife and I don't understand why she didn't understand this. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you can't really text your wife. It's not about texting. Yeah. So, Yeah. Um, we'll see how it goes, but I, I, I fear that one of the differences is that uh, we're going to go more virtual, not less, but brave new world, right? Brave new world. I don't know. I think, you know, there is a degree to which this feels a bit like a universal reset. You know, I think uh, as, as Americans, as a, as a whole, the, the United States, I think we, we push really hard. We work really hard. Um, and, and, you know, to the point of exhaustion, we, we, a lot of, I would say even most work overtime or, you know, put in a lot of hours and this kind of forces us to, to take a step back and, and take a breath and, and reprioritize, you know, what's important in life. And, um, I, I would love to see us, you know, being more social on the other side of this, uh, rather than less. Cool. Well, I hope you're right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see. I don't have, I, you know, I guess we'll, the only time will tell, right? I think it'll probably, you know, th those who enjoy being social will be more social and those enjoy being on social media. <laughs> will not. Yeah. Excellent. Well, before we go, is there, is there anything you'd like to plug? Uh, not at the moment. Just, uh, just wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you for having me on. Um, and it's always, uh, always a pleasure. You and I have a, a lot of, uh, really great conversations and, uh, I really appreciate the, the work that you do. Um, you know, not just your negotiations course, but, you know, I know you're, you're doing a lot of other courses right now. Um, and every opportunity that I have to get, uh, to get trained, uh, by you is, is, is an honor. So thank you for having me here and, uh, I look forward to, uh, engaging again. All right, man. Thanks. And uh, don't forget when, uh, when, when you can go public, we're having you back. All right. Great. All right. <laughs> I look forward to it. All right. Take care. You Bye. too.